Uh, Murray, one small thing. Yeah. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? In 2019, Warner Brothers released Joker, an origin story for Batman's greatest nemesis, written and directed by Hangover director Todd Phillips. A commercial success, the film grossed over a billion dollars at the worldwide box office and went on to receive numerous Oscar nominations and a Best Actor win for Joaquin Phoenix. A sequel was inevitable, but not in the way that we expected. Much was being made before the film's release in relation to the musical elements that were set to be included, taking Arthur Fleck's melodramatic anti-capitalist tale and turning it into a dark and brooding musical. Joker Folia Deux was released in October 2024 to widespread criticism, with film critics towing the line praising the performances but critiquing the execution, while fans and audiences seemingly rejected the film before it even hit the ears. I recently took my A-level class to see Folia Deux, as we just finished studying the 2019 original. Trepidation was afoot knowing the general reaction that had hit social media upon its release, and the general response from the class was negative, but there was just something about the film that I couldn't shake. I had spent weeks with my class analysing and overanalyzing the 2019 film to prepare them for the examined content, so maybe I went into the sequel with too much of an analytical brain, but I am utterly convinced that the conceit surrounding one of the most satisfying reveals of Joker, the truth behind Arthur's neighbour Sophie Dumond, was repeated and reused in Folia Deux through the character of Harleen Quinzel. Yep, I think that she is a figment of Arthur's imagination, his wildly overactive imagination, and a defence mechanism for him to survive his trial. So in a Farandon film first... Let's get our tinfoil hats on. Let's go full into conspiracy theory mode. As I ask you the question, is Harley real? Before we get into Folia Deux, let's recap that Sophie reveal from the first film. Arthur lives in an apartment building with his mother and he bumps into Sophie and her daughter in the lift of the building. Sophie makes a gesture to Arthur as if to insinuate shooting herself in the head. From this point on, we see Arthur following Sophie, apparently beginning a sort of infatuation with her, which she apparently very quickly deduces and approaches Arthur about. After Arthur kills the three men on the subway, he rushes to Sophie's apartment and kisses her. This narrative arc comes to a head when Arthur enters Sophie's apartment and she's shocked to find him sitting there initially confusing the audience before revealing that the majority of the film, and in fact, the majority of their interactions to this point, have been purely fictitious. They have been a creation of Arthur's imagination. Now, on to Folia and obviously, spoilers are afoot. So I'm going to kick off with the first thing that happens in the film that made me think straight away, this isn't real, that Harley... Harleen Quinzel, Harley Quinn, Lee, however it is that you want to refer to her, is purely a product of Arthur's imagination, just like Sophie was, but in this film instead. And that is the scene where Arthur is being taken to a music group or past a music group in Arkham and he locks eyes on Harley. This is quite early in the film. Now, it might be, if you're to believe my ramblings here, the only time where Harley may have actually existed. Now, I'm not saying that she doesn't exist at all. What I am saying is in that moment, when Arthur walks past the room and locks eyes on her, that might be legitimate that, yes, she was a character in the film, in that scene, and she exists in that moment. So the very next thing that happens is Arthur steps out onto the corridor, shouts Arthur, who turns around, turns to Harley, and then makes a shooting myself in the head gesture just like Sophie did in the first film. And as we know, from that point on, Arthur creates the relationship between he and her. So that's the first point. That's where I'm starting this off on. Later in the film, shortly after, Arthur and Lee have a conversation outside the music room. And Lee shows that she grew up in the same neighborhood as Arthur. Because what we know about Arthur so far with the 2019 film is that his fiction, the things that he makes up, wouldn't stretch that far at all because it's all he knows. He's quite a sheltered person. He lives quite a sheltered life. So he's not going to necessarily know too much if somebody was to say to him, I didn't grow up in your neighbourhood. I grew up in 
Queens or the Bronx or Manhattan, for example. But instead, this fiction, this this imagined person, this imagined relationship relies on everything that Arthur already knows. It's just an extra person that's been introduced. Lee tells Arthur that she had an abusive father who died in a car crash. Now, Arthur doesn't know his father either because he's adopted. And Lee then goes on to admit that she was admitted because she burnt down her parents' apartment building. This is a nuclear option for Arthur. This is a sort of total, let's get rid of the person's family that I'm talking to so that they need me more than they need anybody else in their life. They have nobody else in their life. So I'm going to be the total and only one person in Lee's life because she has nobody. It's a complete nuclear response to that relationship and to make sure that he is the most important person to this character, to this person that he's made up. It is fully exaggerated, and it's something to come back to later, as there's a bit more of a twist in that tale. During the screening of the 1953 film The Bandwagon, Lee sets a fire in the back of the room, and both her and Arthur try to escape Arkham. Now, there is a literal divide in the scene when they are being taken away from quite a high-angle establishing shot if you want to call it an establishing shot looking down on Arkham and for this Arthur is placed into solitary confinement we don't know about Lee we don't know whether or not she's placed in solitary confinement or not it's just Arthur is thrown in there by the guards which then leads me to my next point with Arthur in solitary confinement Lee somehow manages to get inside of his cell she says that the guards let her in now My knowledge of prisons and and things like that stretch as far as the films that I've seen and the TV shows that I've watched. But I'm fairly certain that if somebody was in solitary confinement, the whole point of that is that they are on their own in solitude and not that willingly a guard would just let another person in. Now, obviously, you get crooked guards and you get all that kind of stuff. But straight away, that was a bit of a plot hole, I suppose you can call it where straight away I was thinking, furthermore, to this point, this can't be real. This this interaction cannot actually be happening. In Arthur's cell, they proceed to have sex. Now, this is one of the most uncomfortable scenes in the film because it's very, very clear that Arthur isn't sure on what to do. Now, you may know that the context surrounding the 2019 film or the release of the 2019 film was around how it may incite violence from an incel community, the involuntary celibate community. Now, whether this is Todd Phillips thinking, we're going to go full meta and we're going to make Joaquin Phoenix's character of Arthur an incel as well, maybe, maybe that's too far on the nose. But this looks like somebody who has no idea what he's doing. He essentially asks Harley to help him. And again, it is just more fuel to the fire that this is all in his head and that he has imagined everything that is going on in this scene. Arthur is then interviewed by a character called Paddy Myers, who is played by Steve Coogan. Now, in this scene, Paddy is looking to poke the bear a little bit, is looking to generate some sort of reaction from Arthur that is being televised ahead of his trial. And the assumption being that it's quite a high-profile interview on TV because of what Arthur has done. Now, at the end of this scene, Arthur starts singing to the TV, to the screen, to the camera, and getting a reaction from Harley, who is watching it on the streets by a video store or by a TV store. Arthur sees this as a full romantic gesture. He thinks that this is the right thing to do in the same way that he couldn't see through society poking fun at him when he was making jokes and and appearing on the Murray Franklin show in the first film. Shortly after this scene, Arthur's lawyer, Mary Ann, played by Catherine Keener, reveals that Lee, Harley, was actually a psychiatry student who grew up in the Upper West Side and that her father, a doctor, is very much still alive. Furthermore, she voluntarily committed herself in Arkham, checked herself out, and never burnt down an apartment building. Now, I don't know about you, but the conceit of somebody being able to check themselves in and check themselves out of a psychiatric facility doesn't really buy with me, doesn't really stroke with me. So take that for what you will. I take that as fiction once again. 
Harley then reveals to Arthur that she's pregnant. That would be the answer to the family that he's been looking for, the family that he's been missing. He yearns for normality, and he's not had that. But him thinking or him believing that he is in love with somebody and ultimately they can have a family together, that is the sort of, once again, to use a word that I've used before, nuclear option for him and having a family and having people to care about and people who depend on him. Lee also states that she's moved into Arthur's old apartment building in order to create a home for them. Once again, Arthur's fiction, Arthur's imagination, can only stretch as far as his reality. He can only see certain things. He can only take in certain things. He only knows certain things. So the fact that of all the places, and yes, this might link to Lee being obsessive rather than fictional, but of all the places for her to move into and to create a family home for them is the same place where Arthur grew up with his mother. Later in the film, Lee goes to visit Arthur in Arkham after she has removed herself in the facility. Now, throughout the film, there's almost a running motif that if Arthur wants a cigarette, he needs to make the guards laugh and the guards will provide him with a cigarette. When Arthur sits down to speak to Harley over the, the use of the phones and through the glass, there is a pack of cigarettes waiting for him. Why would this moment be any different? It would be different because it's completely fictional. In the courtroom scenes, which were my favourite moments of the film, Arthur quickly descends into his Joker persona. There's a premise that Mary Ann, his lawyer, is arguing the fact that he has dissociative disorder and that there are two separate people here. There is Arthur and there is Joker. Arthur quickly does away with Mary Ann and proceeds to defend himself in his Joker persona. And he begins to fall further and further into that dark persona that we were introduced to in the 2019 film. What happens in these courtroom sequences is that initially Lee is sat quite far at the back. And Arthur says to Marianne, next time, can we get Lee a seat closer to where we are? And she doesn't really answer that. She doesn't really respond to that. And then the next day, she's sat closer. And the next day, she's sat closer. Eventually, getting so close that you could say that she is inside his head. In one of the film's musical sequences, there is a point where Arthur attacks District Attorney Harvey Dent with a huge oversized mallet, and Harley gets his blood and mirrors a scene from the first film by painting a smile on her face in somebody else's blood. Now, in the first film, Arthur uses his own blood. But this, again, is fictional. This, again, is fictitious. This is Arthur recounting his greatest hits. He's looking back at the things that made him famous. He's looking back at the things that he's done that people remember him for and associate him with. And he's projecting that onto his fictional persona or this additional fictional persona that is Harley. After Gary Puddles testifies, Arthur begins to denounce the Joker persona. He begins to walk away from it. He admits killing people. He essentially sabotages his own trial and his own defense. And because of this, Lee leaves the courtroom. And in one of the only scenes on the infamous staircase from the first film, Lee decides that actually she's more in love with the idea of the Joker rather than Arthur himself and does away with the relationship and simply walks away. Now, again, this can be seen as because Arthur has got rid of the Joker persona, Harley then goes away at the same time. Or because he's making peace with the things that he's done, he's not needing additional personas or additional people or additional voices in his head to guide him and to tell him different things. Now, there are, admittedly, moments in the film that do away with this theory. Mary Ann Arthur's lawyer mentions how Lee has been spreading the word on the outside for Arthur after she leaves Arkham. Paddy Myers shows Arthur a newspaper where Lee is on the front page. But again, I would assume that Arthur would assume 
that anything about him is not only newsworthy, it's front page worthy. Lee is shown in public breaking a store window to steal a TV that Arthur appears on after he sings to her. Could that just be his imagined response? Could that be him daydreaming, imagining where she was at the time and in the hope that she saw it? In the courthouse, Lee speaks to Marianne, but again, that could be an imagined scene. Now, obviously, I've spent the best part of a week in this headspace, in this energy, giving this theory the time of day, probably clutching at far, far too many straws in an attempt to create some form of affinity or enjoyment for a film that ultimately disappointed me and to avoid it having a dour influence on how I view the 2019 film from here on in. Also, cynicism is getting the better of me. I highly, highly doubt that Todd Phillips has put this much brain power into whether or not Harley exists or not. And if I am being fully cynical, a joke that I've made to my students is that it's probably only a musical because Todd Phillips got bored of writing a sequel to his most successful film that he began to just copy and paste in lyrics of songs that he was listening to at the time and forgot to delete them when he handed in that draft to Warner Brothers. So let me know whether you agree or whether you disagree, whether you think I've just taken this way too far and I've thought too much into it, which is probably the likely way of looking at it. This was an interesting one to do. It was an interesting video to script and to edit and to put together. It's not something that I would usually do on the channel. It's something that I might look into doing more of. This might be a little bit rough around the edges. Some things might not, might not have synced up as well as they could have done and all that kind of stuff. But like I say, let me know what you think. Let me know if you'd like to see any more videos like this because I guarantee you there are probably many, many more films where I have overthought certain things and I have thought far too much into the meaning of a specific item in a film and I can more than happily do more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe, look after each other, and I will see you next time.